The gold standard for diagnosing iron deficiency is a low serum ferritin. Um, the exact cutoff point varies, but for our intents and purposes, if it's less than 40, consider the patient to be iron deficient. But remember that ferritin is an acute phase reactant. So you may have a ferritin higher than that in a patient that is still truly iron deficient. And so you have to understand the um, impact of the sensitivity in, in those clinical situations. So uh, the classic parameters in iron deficiency, you'll have a low serum ferritin, a low serum iron, an increased or elevated TIBC or transferrin, and a low iron saturation. This is pretty characteristic, and you want to remember that. Once you diagnose iron deficiency, though, you're not done. You must pursue the underlying cause, because in the vast majority of adults with iron deficiency, the cause is blood loss of some sort, which is often occult. And the onus is on you to uncover what is the underlying etiology for the iron deficiency. So if you're given a case in a young menstruating female, think about gynecologic blood loss. Older patients, it's occult GI blood loss until proven otherwise. And so you want to think about uh, stool testing, colonoscopy, and careful history and physical exam. And also recall that in, in a minority of patients, it's not a blood loss problem. It could be an absorption problem. And so this could be some of the conditions listed here. The common one that we often see now is patients post-bariatric surgery, who some years later, if they're not put on appropriate vitamin supplementation, and sometimes even if they are, will present with microcytic anemia and iron deficiency, and it is not responsive to oral iron therapy. Um, once you've done all of that, then the next step is to treat. And this is thankfully quite straightforward. You replace iron. Um, in most stable patients, oral iron is the preferred initial method. And remember that when you replace with oral iron now, the optimal dosing is about 65 milligrams of elemental iron or ferrous sulfate is one common preparation once a day or perhaps even every other day. Gone are the days of BID or TID iron supplementation. It doesn't work any better and it actually sometimes works worse related to upregulating hepcidin and patients tolerate it very poorly. So no patient should ever be on twice a day or thrice a day oral iron that we have good data now that suggest that that not only is it not helpful, it's actually harmful. There are certain situations when you will incorporate intravenous iron, such as those patients that either don't respond to oral iron, have very poor tolerance to oral iron, even when you're dosing it correctly, or in patients that have severe symptomatic anemia and you're trying to reduce their transfusion requirements and you don't want to wait the two to three months it takes on average for oral iron to kick in and you like the two to three week average it takes for IV iron to kick in. And the newer IV iron preparations are much safer. Uh, IV iron kind of got a bad rap in the 90s because some of the uh, original preparations of iron dextrin had high incidences of hypersensitivity reactions. Thankfully, those are very rare now with the new iron preparations. So that brings us to our first audience response question. We have a young 18-year-old female who presents with fatigue. She describes normal menses. On exam, she's visibly pale. She has a hemoglobin of 10 with an MCV of 70 and platelet count of 450, slightly elevated. Serum iron is low. Ferritin is also low. TIBC is increased. Iron saturation is 10%. So you correctly diagnose iron deficiency and prescribe oral iron once a day. Two months later, she comes back and she doesn't feel any better. In fact, she might even feel a little bit worse. Abdominal symptoms, dark bowel movements, and she swears that she's taking the iron just as you recommended. Repeat CBC shows persistent anemia that is not improved. Which of the following is the most appropriate next step in management? A direct Coombs test, HIV ELISA, an IgA trans tissue glutaminase, Lecture her on the need to take her iron supplements correctly. I can never say that when with a straight face. Um, and measurement of haptoglobin. What do you guys think is the right answer? Okay, so interesting. So a, a decent proportion of you correctly identified this looks like celiac sprue. And so this is a pretty classic presentation. And when you have sprue, you have an absorption problem in the intestine. And so the iron is not absorbed properly when you give it orally. And the trans tissue glutaminase, as you would have heard in your GI section is, is one of the best diagnostic tests if you're suspecting celiac sprue. The second most popular answer that you all provided was measurement of haptoglobin. That would be something you're doing if you were considering there was hemolysis going on. And this particular case doesn't really have that hemolysis, what I call flavor. Uh, 
and I'm going to talk to you in a few minutes about what that flavor looks like where you really should be thinking about hemolysis, but this is not it. Okay, so continuing our conversation on uh, anemias that are often microcytic, um, as we're comparing and contrasting, anemia of inflammation. It used to be called anemia of chronic disease. Think about this in patients that have some sort of a chronic health condition, chronic infection like osteomyelitis, uh, inflammatory conditions like systemic lupus, cancer, heart failure, and so on. And what happens here is this chronic inflammation is associated with increased production of interleukin-6, which many of you may recognize as an inflammatory cytokine. And what IL-6 does is it upregulates something called hepcidin. And too much hepcidin is not good because what that does is it leads to impaired iron utilization. So in anemia of inflammation, you have iron, you just aren't using it properly. And this hepcidin is mucking things up. And the hepcidin's increased because of the IL-6. So these patients, and so this pathophys will all kind of connect to you when we look at kind of what the parameters are for this condition. Again, the more you understand, the less you have, less you have to memorize, the better off you are. So it can be normocytic or microcytic. Again, a decreased retic count, right? This is a production problem. And so with anemia of inflammation, you'll actually often have an elevated ferritin, right? Inflammation. Ferritin is an acute phase reactant. Um, Serum iron is typically low, and your iron saturation can be normal or lowish, somewhere sort of borderline, not super diagnostic there, but the high ferritin can be helpful, and the TIBC is low. So that's very important. How do you diagnose this condition? There's no gold standard test. You can look for some inflammatory markers like a SED rate or a, a CRP to help support the, the notion that there's underlying inflammation. In refractory cases, you can do a bone marrow biopsy, but that's seldom required in practice. And you treat this anemia by treating the underlying condition, whatever that is, to try to address the inflammation. That's the cause of the IL-6 overproduction. And in selected cases, you can use erythropoietin or red cell transfusions.